Act Three of the Cabinet Minister by Arthur Wing Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Third Act Disaster. The scene is the inner hall at Drumduris Castle, Perthshire, leading on one side to the outer hall and on the other to the picture gallery. It is solidly and comfortably furnished, and a fire is burning in the grate of the large oaken fireplace. It is an afternoon in August. Imogen is sitting at the table reading over a letter she has written. Dear Mr. White, I shall never call him Valentine again, except in my thoughts. Reading. Dear Mr. White, I am sorry to hear that you are discontented with your recent appointment to the deputy assistant head gamekeepership on the Drumduris estate, and that you consider it a sinecure fit only for a debilitated peer. Now for it. Resuming. Permit me to take this opportunity of informing you that I have at length consented to an engagement between myself and Sir Colin MacPhail of Balachievan. Oh, how awful it looks in ink! Resuming. As it is becoming that I should support such a position with dignity, I would prefer not encountering your dislike to stuck-up people by ever seeing you again. Oh, Val. I therefore suggest that you obtain a nastier appointment than that of Deputy Assistant Head Gamekeeper at Drumduris without delay. That will do. Beautifully. In tears. Oh, Val. Why have you never spoken? I know you are poor. But I would have gone away with you and lived cheerfully and economically in that rock if you had but asked me. Why, why have you never asked me? She sits on a footstool looking into the fire. Brooke in shooting dress strolls in with Lady Euphemia. They do not see Imogen. Brooke Twombly, coolly. Well then, Effie, I suppose I may regard our engagement as a fixture. What? I needn't say you find me an excellent husband. Thanks awfully, but perhaps you had better mention the subject to me again at some other time. Well, I shall be rather busy for the next week or two. Oh, quite as you please. Giving him her hand. But you are really too impetuous. Not at all. About to kiss her. You'll permit me, naturally. Lady Euphemia Vibart languidly turning her cheek toward him. Of course. Be careful of my hair. It will not be dressed again before lunch. He kisses her cheek cautiously. Imogen rises without seeing them. Lady Euphemia Vibart to Brooke. Somebody. They stroll away in opposite directions. After all, as he has never been a lover, why shouldn't I see him and mention my engagement in a calm, cool, ladylike way? Tearing up the letter passionately. I must see him once more, in a calm, cool, ladylike way. I'll write just a line, asking him to come to me this morning. As she sits to write, Lady Euphemia and Brooke stroll in again and meet each other. Lady Euphemia Vibart to Brooke. Good morning. Brooke Twombly to Lady Euphemia. Good morning. Why, it's Imogen. Oh, let me congratulate you. Kissing her. The news is too delightful. Thank you. Accept my congratulations also. Splendid fellow, MacPhail. Not one of those men who talk the top of your head off. Imogen writing. No, not quite. Brooke, dear, will you give Mr. White a little note from me? Certainly. By the by, while I think of it, you'll be glad to hear that Effie has honoured me by consenting to a... Uh, marry me, what? Effie? How your mind does run on that subject, Brooke. I'm a gem, throwing her arms round Lady Euphemia's neck. What happy people, both of you. My hair. I'm a gem kissing Brooke. A thousand congratulations, my dear, clever old brother. The bother with Mama will be too wearying. Why a bother? About my pecuniary position, don't you know? You'll hardly credit it. But I haven't the least idea what Pa intends to do for me. But it doesn't matter about that, so that you are deeply attached to each other. Oh, Imogen, that's too ridiculous. 
Quite absurd, what? Besides, if you want money, you can work. Oh, it's no good everybody working. It's this stupid all-round desire to work that throws so many men out of employment. I'll look for Valentine. Imogen gives him her note. He's sure to be about. We're going to shoot over Clay Grossy Moor this morning. He goes out. So you've made up your mind at last? No. Other people have made it up for me. Mama? Yes. Aunt Dora is the principal person who has rendered my life a burden to me. Oh, Imogen. It's true. Every hour of the livelong day, Aunt Dora has goaded me onto this desirable, detestable match. Even at night, she has stalked into my room with a lighted candle, startling me out of my beauty sleep, to tell me she will never rest till I am Lady Macphail. Imogen, it's too kind of Mama to take this interest in you. Interest? It's torture. And at last she threatened that if I married anybody else, she would expire in great pain and appear to be constantly a ghost in her nightgown. Well, you've seen Aunt Dora in her nightgown. You can guess my feelings. And that decided you? I went to Mamma and asked her advice. I guess what that was. Mamma's expression was that she'd give the heels of her best shoes to see me provided for. And so, late last night, while my maid Phipps was washing my head, I gasped out a soapy sort of yes. The dowager enters. Where is Imogen? Here, Mama. Dowager embracing Imogen. My favorite niece. I have just learned your decision over the breakfast table. I was eating cold grouse at the moment. I thought I should have choked. I hope you're satisfied, Aunt. Thoroughly. I feel now that I shall die, a great many years hence, a contented woman. Effie? Yes, Mama? Don't think you're a neglected child. I cannot provide for everybody at once. No, Mama. But having completely settled Imogen, I shall commence the adjustment of your future after lunch. Lady Macphail enters. Ah! Dear Lady Macphail, what glorious news! Lady Macphail rapturously with her hand upraised. No, let the worn banner of the Macphail be run up on the crumbling tower of Castle Balakeven. Certainly, by all means. No, let the roar of the pipes startle the eaglets on the summit of Black Ben Mukti. I hope such arrangements will be made. Let the shriek of the wild birds resound on the shores of Loch Nadoch. Dowager bringing Imogen forward. But you haven't seen Imogen yet. Lady Macphail embracing her. Child. Ah, when Colin learns your answer to his suit, you shall listen to such words as none but a Macphail can utter to his betrothed. Doesn't he know? Not yet. He went out early to watch the sun gilded the grey peak of Ben Ochter. Lady Twombley enters, looking very troubled. Mamma! Lady Macphail, the Dowager, and Lady Euphemia talk together. Mamma, everybody has congratulated me. Have you nothing to say? Lady Twombley places her hand fondly on Imogen's head. Lady Twombley in a sepulchral voice. Did Fibs dry your head thoroughly last night? Yes, Mamma. Then all's well, I suppose. Sir Julian's flute is heard. To herself. The first bill. The first bill due next week. She sits staring at the fire as Sir Julian enters playing the flute. Papa! Imogen, my dear, amidst severe official worries, I must not omit to join in the general paean of rejoicing. Thank you, Papa. Sir Colin may lack that inexhaustible flow of anecdote with which I have often been credited. He may, Papa. But I confess I respect a man who will sit for hours without saying anything. I wish there were more like him in the house. Julian, let the newspapers have details of Imogen's engagement without delay. Oh, no, aunt. 
Not yet. Imogen, if I may use such an expression, for lol. Suffice it, I have a motive. But why the papers? It is our duty to our friends. Do you think if anything serious happened to me, my friends wouldn't like to hear of it? Without delay? Julian! Sir Julian writes. Besides, it will be current talk at the dance tomorrow night. The dance? I, tomorrow night, they shall see a Macphail lead the Strathby with the girl who is to be his bride. No, indeed, they won't. What? I can't make myself so supremely ridiculous. Ridiculous. Oh, Imogen. 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 My dear. Lady Macphail closes her eyes. Sir Julian and the Dowager take her hands. My, My dear, dear Lady, Lady Macphail. Here is Sir Colin. Ah. ah. My boy. Why, he is with Mrs. Gayluster. That woman. That woman. That woman. That woman. Macphail enters with Mrs. Gayluster. He in Highland dress. She wearing a showy costume of tweed tartan with a Scotch bonnet. Colin, lad. Eh, mother? Dear Sir Colin gave me his arm to the top of Ben Octa. To the, to the top, top of Ben Octa? Macphail with an anxious glance at Mrs. Gayluster. Uh, just to see the sunrise. Dowager quietly to Sir Julian. Julian, that's scandalous. I thought you always witnessed the sunrise alone, Colin. As a rule, mother. Dowager to herself. That woman has a motive. Lady Macphail pointing to Imogen. My son, look, here is Imogen. Macphail to Imogen. Uh, good morning. Colin, lad, don't you guess? No, mother. Lady Macphail rapturously. No, let the worn banner of the Macphail be run up on the crumbling tower of Castle Balakaven. Macphail vacantly. Uh, for what reason, mother? Now let the shriek of the wild birds sound on the shores of Loch Nadoich. Why? Lady Macphail embracing Macphail. Imogen is to be your bride. Macphail blankly. Oh. Sir Julian, the Dowager, and Lady Euphemia congratulate him. Most gratified. I have a mother's yearnings toward you. We are too rejoiced. Mrs. Gayluster to herself. They've hooked him. Lady Macphail bringing Macphail down. Hush! Speak to her, Colin lad. Let her hear how Macphail greets the woman of his choice. Lady Macphail joins Sir Julian, the Dowager, and Lady Euphemia, while they all watch Macphail as he approaches Imogen. Listen! Macphail to Imogen. Uh, I'm very much obliged to you. Bravely spoken. A grand nature. Thank you, Sir Colin. She joins the others. Mrs. Gayluster to Macphail, seizing his hand. May your life be very, very blissful. Macphail uneasily withdrawing his hand. Mother's looking. He joins the rest. Mrs. Gayluster to herself. They've hooked my Scotch salmon. But they haven't landed him yet. Intercepting Lady Twombley as she advances toward the group. Kate! Reptile! I'm not at all satisfied with the way things are going on here. Aren't you? I think things are beautifully smooth. I'm pretty comfortable at Drumdurus myself, thank you. But I'm getting extremely anxious about Joseph. Oh, so am I. I'm afraid Joseph isn't enjoying his little holiday at all. Did you observe him at dinner last night? <laughs> Who could help it? The man eats enough for six. He's obliged to, his holiday being so brief. But these fine folks treat him as contemptuously as if he were a snail in a cabbage. 
then why does he talk with the leg of a grouse sticking out of the side of his mouth why does he drink people's health across the table and call the man-servants old chaps dear joe there's nothing classy about him drum durse and shooting dress enters carrying a light wooden box why does he swallow his knife and build pyramids with his bread and tell long stories with no meaning at all or else with two well you must take joe as heaven made him so you'd better make things smooth for him with lord drumdurus if not if not if not joe might after all decline to renew oh and then there would be the devil to pay wouldn't there as far as i can see there are two devils to pay already aha here's drumdurus remember after talking to the others drumdurus approaches lady twombley bowing stiffly to mrs gaylester who shakes her fist behind his back lady twombley gives a small nervous shriek aunt lady twombley with her hand to her heart <laughs> spasms mrs gaylester smiling sweetly at drumdurus delightful morning she takes up a newspaper sir julian and lady euphemia stroll out lady twombley to drumdurus keith dear i want to say a word to you about dear mr lebanon uh, aunt have patience keith patience when i begged you to entertain him at drum durris i didn't deceive you i distinctly told you he was one of nature's noblemen i would do much to please you aunt kate but this individual and his sister <laughs> you must follow the democratic tendencies of the age keith the peer must go hand in hand with the pig yes but let it be a companionable clubable pig oh i have just left him at the breakfast table is he making a tolerable breakfast this morning he seems to be making every breakfast in great britain oh, i see him at it he consumes enough coffee to put fire out yes and he swoops down on a cold bird like a vulture it's hideous to see him hurl himself at an omelette i know and with eggs he's a conjurer what's he engaged on now when i left him he was an unrecognizable mass of marmalade he must go don't disregard the sacred laws of hospitality i must at another time i might endure him but now i am utterly crushed by my own agonizing trouble hock what's the matter my son angel appears with the infant angel mysteriously is it all right my lord hush to lady twombley is agidia there sir julian and lady euphemia re-enter no lady twombley joins sir julian and lady euphemia earl of drumdurus to angel all right twombley to the infant my soldier boy angel advances to drumdurus he produces a small toy gun and a little drum from a box he carries and hands them to angel don't let lady drumdaris discover these no above all let the drum be muffled yes my lord Egidia enters i expect some small cannon by the evening post go Egidia comes between angel and drumdaris the dowager following ah oh my lady i am right then she takes the toys from angel and points to the door angel withdraws with the infant keith egidia don't disagree here egidia to drumdurus i was loath to credit you with such treachery name some convenient hour to disagree this afternoon i will willingly be present i have long suspected this conspiracy to anticipate my son's mature judgment Keith, there is a gulf between us which can never be bridged over. Egidia joins the others. Mother, my life is wasted. 
valentine roughly dressed in cords and gaiters enters followed by brooke are you ready lord drumdurus we are waiting i presume for mr lebanon i'll go and stir him up ugh what brooke goes out you'll not join us sir julian i daren't melton has arrived from town with a mass of papers for my signature quietly to drumdurus the raj putana canal question is wearing me out valentine white whispering to amagen i have your note i'll return in a few minutes mr joseph lebanon outside shootin my dear sir when i was in the south hampstead artillery i could have shown you what shootin was there's joe she goes out to meet lebanon oh that Ugh, man that man Ugh. That man. Oh, that, uh, man. that man. Oh, that man. That man. Oh, that man. That man. That man. All gather into groups as Lebanon, looking very ridiculous in Highland costume, enters followed by Brooke. Mr. Joseph Lebanon slapping MacPhail on the back. Mac, dear old boy, haven't seen you this morning. MacPhail turns away distrustfully lady mac are you delightful whispers sir an approaching happy event we're like the doves we're pairing off eh we're pairing off lady macphail stares at him and turns away he wipes his forehead anxiously it's a little difficult to keep up a long conversation with them they're not what i'd term rattlers ain gidea the fair hostess ahem <clears throat> we missed you at the breakfast table lady drum can't congratulate you on your peck excuse my humour egidia stares at him and joins lady macphail to himself they're a chatty lot i must say they're a chatty lot i wish fanny had stick by me and cut in occasionally here's lady t she can't ride the aisles at any rate lady t mr lebanon you didn't honour me with my game of crib last night i i had a headache never had an headache in me life don't know how it's spelt it's spelt with an h mr joseph lebanon to lady euphemia offering her flowers from his coat lady effie me floral offering lady euphemia catches up her skirts and sweeps past him to himself chatty eh chatty he comes face to face with the dowager who glares at him ha hm offering her the flowers oh yeah uh, had these picked for you by jove i did a present from joseph what sir mr joseph lebanon replacing the flowers in his coat excuse my humour wiping his brow again chatty i do wish fan had cut in and come and help me uh, slaps sir julian on the shoulder twombly old fellow sir not coming out with us today eh no getting past it i suppose i am kept indoors by pressure of work mr lebanon Oh, of course, the Rajputana Canal question, eh? I'm a big shareholder in the Rajputana Railway, you know. I say, tell me. I cannot discuss official matters with you. Sir Julian turns from him. Mr. Joseph Lebanon to himself as he sits down. Chatty, chatty. I know what this'll end in. It'll end in my standing on my dignity. Where's Fanny? addressing the others talking about shooting i'll tell you an amusing little story sir julian twombley to lady twombley and others sotto voce no no it's all about meself brooke twombley whispering to the others good-bye we're off there is a general movement the ladies and sir julian saying good-bye to the shooters unnoticed by lebanon who has his back to them. 
I was spending a day or two down in Essex with my old friend Captain Boulder, South Hampstead Artillery. Dear old Tom, great favourite with the girls, excuse my humour. Lady Twombley, Imogen, Lady Euphemia, Vibart, Sir Julian Twombley, Lady Macphail, and Dowager, quietly, to the shooters. Goodbye. 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 It was wild fowl Tom and I were after. We were lying in a ditch waiting for the ducks to drift in with the tide. As Lebanon continues his story, all the others gradually and quietly disperse. I counted fifty-seven birds through me glass. So said I to Tom, Tom, I'm in juiced good form, me boy. Devil you are, said Tom. And I lay a pony to a penny that fifteen of those birds fall to my gun. Done, says Tom. He is now alone in the room. Well, to make a short story a long one, excuse my humour, Tom sneezed. Up I got, so did the ducks. And then what the juice do you think happened? I oh, say, what the juice do you think? Discovering that he is alone. Well, I'm um, chatty, ain't they? Chatty. Mrs. Gayluster enters. Joe, why aren't you with the shooters? Why, they hooked it when I was telling them the tale of Tom Boulder and the ducks. Never mind, my pet. It's rude, that's what it is. It's just rude. Come along. We'll walk on to the moor. What are you going to, Fan? Yes, dear. Your poor Fanny has a little bit of fun on. Oh, Fan, if only I had your confidence, your push. But the rudeness of these people is getting on me nerves. Why, Joseph? I feel a little hurt, Fan, a little hurt. Valentine enters. Mr. Lebanon. Oi, where are they? Just starting in the drag. Be quick. Mr. Joseph Lebanon to Mrs. Gayluster. Come on, they shall hear about Tom Boulder and the ducks before I'm done with them. Come on. Mrs. Gayluster and Lebanon hurry out. Mr. Joseph Lebanon outside. Hey, hey. That fellow was born to hail an omnibus. Imogen appears. Imogen not seen Valentine. Will he be long? She encounters him. Oh! You are not neglecting your duties, I hope, Valentine? I shall follow the others in the cart. Your note was marked urgent. Was it? Valentine White showing her letter. Urgent. What a thoughtless habit it is to mark all one's letters urgent. All I wanted to say to you is this. But it isn't urgent. No, no, I understand that. I merely had a foolish desire to be the first to acquaint you of my undeserved happiness. What happiness don't you deserve? The happiness of becoming Lady Colin MacPhail, Valentine. Oh, is that all? That's all. Just at present. Ha! You'll be a fine lady now, past recovery. I shall endeavour to adequately fill the station of life to which fate has called me. All that sweet simplicity of yours in London was purely an assumption, I suppose. Things are what they appear. But you have your heart's desire at last, I presume? I, I presume I have. Valentine White burying his head in his hands. Oh. What are you going to do next? Japan. Nice part of Japan? The murderous districts. Oh. Then you don't propose to return alive? Not according to my present arrangements. <laughs> you... you'd better follow the shooters to Cligrossi now. Certainly. I'm glad to have had this gossip over our prospects. We... we both seem to be doing well. Good morning. She offers her hand, which he takes ungraciously. Good morning. You haven't congratulated me yet, in the usual way. Will you be happy with him? I think, partially. 
but you're not going to partially marry sir colin how dare you do this he was the first to ask me val the first to ask you you don't mean to suggest that any other man would have done no not any other some other it's too late now but yes a poor man val would i have stood the remotest chance it's too late now would i would i no nor any other nineteenth-century savage savage mr white it is very much too late now but why when you returned to england didn't you wear uncomfortable clothes like other gentlemen and a very high collar and varnished boots like other gentlemen why because i cannot be false to my principles people say that principles which deal too much with the outside of things are nothing but affectations imogen if a man has a good heart he should have a good hat imogen jenny if i had ever come to you in a good hat if you had then when mamma urged me to marry perhaps she would not have blamed me for for what for liking some pleasant-looking gentleman who laughed at harmless follies instead of scolding them and now 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 it is too late she falls into his arms he embraces her mr joseph lebanon outside hey hey come here hey oh she breaks away from valentine and runs out as lebanon enters very pale and upset mr joseph lebanon clinging to valentine old fella what's the matter with you Grr, you you wanted lady twombley enters good gracious something has happened i'm afraid valentine goes out lady twombley to lebanon you're ill oh, i'm upset <laughs> too much breakfast now i've i've peppered mcphile peppered him can't you take your mind off eating you don't understand i was in the wagonette telling em the story of tom bolter and those beastly ducks i got hold of a beastly gun and just as i was demonstrating how i shot the fifteen beastly birds <gasps> it went off well don't make such a fuss of it <gasps> and it was pointed at sir colin pointed at him nah his legs were stuck right in the way heavens be quiet make light of it make light of it like i do now now i hope you're content no i'm not i wouldn't have had this happen for half a sovereign this high land holiday of mine is getting on me nerves your nerves yes lady t imagine what it must mean to a shy man to get a rollicking august with a lot of people whose chief occupation is staring at the tips of their own aquiline noses <laughs> imagine what it must be to a shy man to find himself always leading the conversation instead of following up with a sparkling comment or two as i'm in the habit of doing in me own circle think of me starting every topic and arguing on it till me throat's sore making every joke and roaring at it till i get blood to the head sometimes when i'm in the middle of a long story and not a soul listener i feel so lonely i i could almost cry <laughs> then out of your own sufferings why can't you find some compassion for mine it's pathetic that's what my position is it's just pathetic in mercy's name why don't you retire quietly to your room and pack what throw up the sponge you needn't throw up your sponge pack your sponge i understand lady t hook it hook it is a harsh way of putting it bring your visit to a close think of what you are losing here think of margate where i feel you must have many dear friends oh i've half a mind to oh, bless you mr lebanon bless you 
I'll fetch you a Bradshaw. Stop, I forgot the hop. The hop? There's a ball here tomorrow night. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't wait for the hop. I've had half a dozen lessons in the Scotch reel before I left town. And you would risk the reel on half a dozen lessons? Madman! Half a dozen lessons at store prices. Dash it all, you wouldn't have me waste them. Oh, hopeless. Sir Julian enters unobserved by Lebanon or Lady Twombley. Look here, Lady T. I'm sorry to disappoint a lady, but it ain't Mr. Joseph Lebanon's principle to do something for nothing. No. If you lend a lady your arm, you'd do it at interest. I'm not alluding to our pleasant financial relationship, Lady T. What I infer is that if after the fourth coming up, I drag meself away from me sovereign friends at Drumdurris, I expect, uh, uh, a salatium. Sir Julian remains watching and listening. Uh, what? Lady T, me pride has been wounded in this house. Me self-respect has been hurt. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm hysterical. If you could heal me feelings by rendering me a service. To be rid of you. Oh, Lady T, how plainly you put it. Well, yes. Try me. Sir Julian disappears suddenly. Hush! Thought I heard somebody. Lady T, you are aware that Mr. Joseph Lebanon's position in the financial world is an eminent one? I wasn't aware of it. Take it from me, Lady T, take it from me. But that distinguished position might be advanced by the success of some delicate little financial operations, which I'm on the brink of, Lady Twombly, on the brink of. Lady T, if I could know twenty-four hours in advance of the prime newspapers, the decision of the government on the Rajputana Canal question, it would go far to heal the wound me self-respect has received in this recherche island home. You follow me, Lady T? I suppose you mean that when the decision of the government is known in the city, something or other will go up and something or other will go down on the stock exchange. Is that it? That's it, Lady T, that's it. And some fellows will make fortunes. Oh, Lady T. Oh, but why do you bother a poor woman with a headache? Because without the gentle guidance of tender-hearted woman, I can't find out whether the government is going to grant the concession for the cutting of the Rajputana Canal. Oh, Lady Twombly. Let me have five minutes alone with Sir Julian's papers in Sir Julian's room. Mr. Lebanon. Two minutes. A stroll around. I'll go in with a duster and tidy up. Oh. Or give me a glimpse of some of the documents Mr. Melton brought with him in that box yesterday. I want some fresh air. Wait, if you do this for me. I'll clear out of Drum Darris with Fanny on Thursday morning. Oh, no. And I'll hand you back your acceptances. Every one of them I will. On my word of honour as a gentleman. She seizes him by the throat and shakes him violently. Oh, how dare you? How dare you tempt me? Mr. Joseph Lebanon, arranging his hair and moustache with his pocket comb and mirror. Oh, ladies are trying in business. They are just trying. You, you wretch. Do you think I haven't endured enough for the past three months without this? Oh, Pa, what will you say to your kitty when you know the disgrace she's brought on you? Oh, my chicks, my chicks, my blessed chicks. Lady Twombley, 
Me pride has been wounded. Me self-respect has been hurt in this recherche island home, for I hope the last time. I shall retire from the hop early tomorrow night, knock it. Bring my visit to a close on Thursday morning. Thank you. Next week, the first bit of paper bearing the honoured name of woman falls due. Oh. I repeat the word, D-U-E, due. Mr. Lebanon. Our interview has been a distressing one, Lady Twombley. It is over. Mr. Lebanon. Mr. Lebanon. He turns his chair from her to herself. It's all up with me. I, I'll go and find Pa and tell him. There's no help for it. I'll tell him. Mr. Lebanon, for the last time, have compassion on a poor fool of a woman. He turns away. Oh, I'll go to Pa's room and tell him. She goes out. That's one way to the old gentleman's room. He opens the door and listens. Ah, what's the latest quotation for lovely woman's weakness? Valentine enters with Mrs. Gayluster MacPhail, who looks very scared, has a handkerchief bound round his knee, and leans on Mrs. Gayluster's arm. She supports him to a chair. Mrs. Gayluster to Sir Colin. Lean on your poor broken-hearted friend. Mr. Joseph Lebanon to himself. Oh, the juice. I'll find Lady MacPhail. He goes out. Mrs. Gayluster whispering to Lebanon. Get out of sight. Mr. Joseph Lebanon quietly to her. Can't. I must wait here. I've got an important little affair on. So have I. Leave us. Oh, my goodness. How selfish you are, Fanny. Selfish? You'll ruin my prospects in life, brute. Vixen! Bah! Bah! Lebanon goes out. Mrs. Gayluster throws herself on her knees beside MacPhail. How do you feel now? Well, it's tingling. Tingling? You bear it like a hero. I appreciate the compliment, but I'm thinking I'm only a bit singed. Ah, but why, why do you indulge in these reckless sports? I was merely sitting in the drag, looking at the sky. Sitting in the drag, looking at the sky? How foolhardy! Whereupon your brother, without a word of warning, blazed away at my knee. Ah, don't describe it. Suppose you had had your head on your knee. Lady MacPhail outside. Take me to Colin. My mother. Mrs. Gayluster to herself. Drat your mother. She stands with her handkerchief to her eyes. Lady MacPhail enters with Agidia, the Dowager, Lady Euphemia, and Valentine. Sir Colin. Dowager sitting at a writing table. I'll telegraph to Sir George McCarnes, the surgeon. No, let the wail of the lament waken the echoes of the black Ben Mukti. MacPhail rising from the chair. It's not at all necessary, mother. He can stand. Dowager writing. Bring chloroform and knives. Ah, Colin, lad, why did we ever quit the grey shores of Loch Nadoich? I'll go upstairs and bathe my knee, mother. Lady MacPhail leads him. He can walk. Madam, a MacPhail can always walk under any circumstances. Dowager reading the telegram she has written. If in doubt, amputate. Lady MacPhail, MacPhail, Valentine, Lady Euphemia, Agidia, and the Dowager go out. Mrs. Gayluster weeping till the others are out of sight. Joseph will die of remorse. <laughs> Calling. Psst. The coast is clear, Joseph. Joe! As she goes out, Lady Twombley enters with great agitation, clutching an important-looking document. 
oh kitty what have you done kitty what have you done lebanon enters lady t thought so seeing the paper oh my goodness what has she got here i must i must find julian oh mr joseph lebanon snatching the paper from her excuse me <gasps> give me back that paper lady t oh lady t lady twombley following him round the table give me back that paper dear sweet mr lebanon mr joseph lebanon reading the paper ha oh don't read it my friend sir julian's own writing the rash putana canal is a blessed fact lady twombley i forget my wounded pride i forgive the blow to my self-respect you have won a place in joe lebanon's art give me back that paper and forget it mr joseph lebanon returning the paper give it you back delighted forget it oh lady t lady t devil lady twombley joseph lebanon is above all things a man of honour handing bills to lady twombley lovely woman's acceptances i won't take them i won't buy them back at such a price natural delicacy laying bills on the table you can pick em up when i'm gone oh what a wicked woman i am i can get out of these beastly clothes drive to strachlachlan junction and wire to town before feeding time the city is on the eve of a financial earthquake joseph's name will be an household word from mile end to kensington lady twombley we meet at the op tomorrow night for the last time in society whoa dash society he performs a few steps of a highland dance excuse my humour he goes out the bills the bills they mustn't lie there as she goes to the table sir julian looking very white and dishevelled enters and standing opposite to her takes up the bills and presents them to her pa lady twomley oh my gracious she drops on her hands and knees at sir julian's feet <laughs> you found me out pa you found me out i have found you out how did you manage it by degrading myself to the position of an eavesdropper <laughs> that's pretty mean pa ain't it seeing that he is examining the bills she puts up her hands and seizes them oh don't tot them up don't tot them up Catherine when i first saw you three and twenty years ago you were standing over a tub in the tiled yard of your father's farm wringing out your little sister's pinafores oh. <laughs> could i have looked forward i should have known that you would one day wring my feelings as you do now pa i've fallen into the hands of the unscrupulous woman oh don't call me that pa the unscrupulous you have lost the right to ever again use that serviceable word what do you mean how do you come by those bills <laughs> julian you know going toward him on her knees frantically oh don't stare like that putting her arms round him husband dear husband you are glaring like an idiot listen she shakes him violently listen when that reptile tempted me i ran upstairs intending to tell you all i did oh pa don't stare at nothing i knocked at your door there was a drumming in my ears and i fancied your voice answered me telling me to enter oh try winking pa try winking your room was empty left unguarded the door unlocked i entered wink pa for mercy's sake wink 
i sank into a chair to wait for your coming take in the written paper from her pocket and there on your table right before my eyes i saw this thing like a white ghost a memorandum in my writing that the concession for the rajputana canal is to be granted yes yes i tried to forget it was there but the chairs and tables seemed to dance before me and every object in the room had a voice crying out kitty you silly woman get back your bills from that demon who is plaguing you i put my fingers in my ears and then the voices were shut up in my brain and still they shrieked kitty get back your bills get back your bills i snatched up this paper and ran from the room even then if i had met you julian i should have been safe but whenever old nick wants to play the deuce with a married lady he begins by taking her husband for a stroll and so i fell into lebanon's clutches and i i i'm done for she sinks into a chair catherine those bills must be returned to the creature lebanon yes and and pa dear you'll never speak kindly to me after this will you i trust i shall be invariably polite to you catherine oh we shall be whitewashed in the bankruptcy court eventually i suppose all in good time catherine and then what then then we must hope for a cottage and a small garden where we can grow our own vegetables and learn wisdom our own vegetables and years hence pa sometimes when i am sitting over my knitting you will forget the past and play your flute again and be happy catherine he takes his flute from his pocket and breaks it into pieces across his knee never never again catherine as he is leaving her one pang of remorse i can spare you catherine don't you believe you have betrayed a solemn secret of the government to that unprincipled money-lender of course that you have not done pa no catherine overhearing his shameful proposition and fearing your weakness i had time to hasten to my room conceal all important papers and scribble the memorandum you abstracted why then that writing records the exact reverse of the truth and and joseph in the language of the vulgar mr lebanon is sold he goes out julian ah! staring at the paper the exact reverse of the truth then the rajputana canal julian why should you be first blackened and then whitewashed because of your vagabond wife a cottage our our own vegetables never why shouldn't i have my delicate little financial operations in this city oh my gracious Dundurus and brooke enter hello mater what brooke keith you boys must drive me over to strachleren junction i must telegraph to london backwards and forwards all day keith put me into communication with your stockbroker in town aunt silence i'm on the brink of some delicate little financial operations to brook get out the cart the drag's outside come on lebanon enters hastily i drum doris let me have a carriage to go to Strathlachlan junction i want to wire to town do you so do we we'll give you a lift come on they all hurry out end of the third act act four of the cabinet minister by arthur wing pinero this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fourth Act, Dancing 
the scene is still the inner hall of drumduris castle now brilliantly lighted and florally decorated the evening after the events of the previous act waltz music is heard then a slight scream and lebanon in full highland costume enters hastily i oh, wouldn't have had it happen for half a sovereign the monketric a fiery old gentleman in highland dress enters sir i am most indignant i've explained i felt myself going and i called it what came nearest my daughter came nearest i oh, know don't make such a fuss about it do you remember we're at a ball miss monkittrick is torn to ribbons all right make light of it make light of it like i do ah drum durris in highland dress enters with miss mckintrick who is much discomposed and a giddy who is soothing her earl of drum durris to mckintrick my dear sir papa oh flora flora lord drum durris let it blow over we're all forgetting we're at a ball miss mckintrick has been rolled upon the floor she was passing at the time i didn't select her don't be so conceited lebanon continues to explain monkittrick is indignant drum durris endeavours to soothe him brooke enters carrying a satin shoe which he presents to miss mckintrick awfully sorry what brooke hurries out where is papa imogen enters carrying an aigrette oh miss mckintrick what a shocking mishap they fasten the aigrette in miss mckintrick's hair have you seen my papa lady euphemia carrying a sash hurries in as imogen goes off miss mckintrick rising lady euphemia and egidia adjust the sash hastily lady euphemia vibart adjusting the sash my dear flora this is too unfortunate brooke re-enters with another shoe the other what to lady euphemia there are some more pieces come and help brooke and lady euphemia hurry out i want my papa see mckittrick huh the monkittrick giving her his arm flora we'll go home papa i'm not nearly ah oh. her argette is very much on one side her sash is trailing and she limps away carrying one slipper pray don't think of going let it blow over my dear sir oh very well you're losing the best of the ball the mckittrick and miss mckittrick go out followed by egidia and drumduris imogen lady euphemia and brooke enter hastily each carrying a fragment of miss mckittrick's dress mr joseph lebanon taking the remnant allow me allow me my affair imogen lady euphemia and brooke go out lebanon crams the pieces of miss mckittrick's dress under a chair cushion let it blow over where's me partner he goes out macphail enters with mrs gayluster upon his arm staying out is infinitely preferable to dancing is it not dear sir colin i i hate dancing but your dear mother says you resemble some beautiful wild thing when you dance the strathsby that's because i hate it the strathsby's enough to make a lad wild witty boy hey do you think i'm naturally quick 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 in my understanding i'm sure of it eh i'm glad you think i'm quick why because balloch even that's our place you understand balloch even is enough to soften a lad's brain then why hide your light at balloch even well the macphails have lived there since eleven hundred and two how romantic so mother's just got out of the way of moving charming attachment to an old home ay it's old it hasn't been papered and done up since robert bruce stayed with us robert bruce ay 
just from a saturday till monday i'm thinking there must be a legend attached to every stone of baluchivan ay it's interesting but it requires papering oh, i'm so tired of baluchivan but you love the rugged country the vast overwhelming hills and the placid lochs mother has been telling you that isn't it true eh i'm just weary of my native scenery but what about the misty chasms of ben Muhti? that's an awfully damp place that's where i caught my bad cold and the grey shore of loch Nadoich. your mother says you adore it eh i am sick of loch Nadoich. and your feet don't ache to press the heather it's when they're on the heather my feet ache it's poor walking heather then you don't watch the sun rise from the jagged summit of benafichan macphail cunningly eh but i do though every day when i'm at home but why uh, to get away from mother poor boy macphail reflectively i've been thinking yes that you'd better let go of my arm now sir colin i've no personal objection you understand but mother's always looking for me how thoughtless i am he walks away sir colin i your mother is driving you to contract this marriage with miss twombley well mother's just making the arrangements your great heart hasn't gone out to her unhappiness must ensue your bright career will be dimmed will be what dimmed what did you think i said oh sir colin don't carry this unsuitable bride to balochivan well it's a serious step but i've been thinking it would be another in the house you don't want another in the house you need a strong self-reliant wife who will take you out of the house eh a woman loving but firm tender but enterprising who will bear you from your dilapidated home and plunge you into the vortex of some great city suddenly have you ever been to paris no i know every inch of it uh, madam oh what have i said sir colin you have guessed my secret macphail produces his ball program from his stocking and refers to it i'm engaged to miss kilbowy for this waltz if you'll excuse me mrs gayluster holding out her hand to him colin i'm thinking mother will be wondering mrs gayluster to herself dry your mouth to macphail never mind dear lady macphail for a moment colin since you have discovered my love for you i will make no further reservation uh, but mother mrs gayluster under her breath dry your to macphail colin i will be to you the wife you have described i am extremely obliged to ye uh, but hush bold boy she gives him a card you know my cruel brother takes me back to town to-morrow here is my address so that you may write to me constantly devotedly macphail reading the card merichet and c court dressmakers mrs gayluster snatching the card from him that's a wrong un i mean that's a mistake uh, giving another there hide it away dear one nearest your heart he slips it into his stocking oh and now as i start in the morning at nine forty five sharp on the tick we must say farewell oh this parting is too cruel colin she falls against him here's my mother he throws her off mrs gayluster under her breath 
Drat your mother! Lady MacPhail enters. Madam? To MacPhail. Why do you leave the ballroom, my lad? I've just been watching the moonlight on Loch Ochentoshan. I'm proud to see this devotion to Loch Ochentoshan, but tonight you have other duties almost equally important. After this paltry waltz, we lose ourselves in the wild pleasures of our native dance. The straps, P? He takes Mrs. Gayluster's card from his stocking. Oh. Hides it and produces his ball program from his other stocking. The straps, P. Come, lad. They have yet to see the MacPhail lead the Strathby with his betrothed. They go out together. Yes. And they shall ultimately see the MacPhail writing love letters to Fanny. Love letters with a promise of marriage in them. I'll consult a solicitor directly I reach town and be ready to marry or to sue him. Oh, Fanny, Fanny, ungrateful girl, what a lot you have to be thankful for. She runs out and Angel peeps in. Me lord, me lady. She enters. I must find me lady, me lady. Lady Twombley enters. No news from Reeves and Shucklebeck, the stockbrokers. Oh, the waiting for it will finish me. Oh, me lady Twombley. Lady Twombley turning to her sharply. Oh, tell me, where is me lord? What, has a messenger come from Strachlachan with a telegram for Lord Drumduris? Speak. I do not know. Oh. But, oh, me lady, I have been a wicked girl. I dare say you have. That's your business. Me lady, the little lord Abba Brosok is indisposed. The baby? Yes. To please me lord, and contrary to me lady's orders, I put lord Abba Brosok to bed with his gun. <gasps> I know. I'm a mother. The child has swallowed the paint. Ah, uh, yes. Send a groom to Strachlachan for Dr. McGubby. Yes, me lady. Angèle. Me lady. Tell the man to inquire at Strachlachan for telegrams for the castle. Yes, me lady. Angèle runs out. Oh, for a telegram from Reeves and Shucklebeck. My diamonds, my double row of pearls for a telegram from Reeves and Shucklebeck. Gideon enters with Angel, followed by Drumduris. Lady Twombley. Has Keith had a telegram? A telegram? No, my son is ill. Oh, I know. He has nibbled his gun. His gun? Yes, me lady. Ah, the army. To Drumduris. So you have gained your own ends after all, Keith, and my boy has fallen. Gideon goes out, followed by Angel. Drumdur sinks into a chair. Keith! Don't speak to me, please, aunt. I must. Reeves and Shucklebeck are strangely silent. Let them remain so. I care not. You don't care. Surely you are anxious to know whether you have been instrumental in saving me from... from growing my own vegetables. Growing your own... Surely you want to know whether you have made me a wealthy woman, or have ruined yourself in the effort. Ruined myself. <laughs> Keith, dear, I am afraid I haven't done what is strictly regular, but when you put me into communication with your stockbrokers, I carried on my delicate little financial operations with them in your name. Aunt Kate. Keith, you're annoyed. May I ask, what delicate little financial operations? I've speculated, on the strength of my private knowledge of the decision of the government on the Rajputana Canal question. I mean, you have speculated. Aunt Wombley, how dare you do such a thing? How dare I? Boy, for you are little more, boy. You wouldn't have a cabinet minister's wife take advantage of her confidential acquaintance with her husband's official affairs 
to advance her own interests oh keith but you've done it no i haven't don't be so dull you've done it and if your delicate little financial operations if they come off you have made what you men call a pile keith all through your blundering auntie you will have made a pile which i hand over to you aunt kate i shall borrow it keith dear may i and if pardon the question if your delicate little financial operations don't come off certainly if they don't come off what then then through your reckless speculation you will have impoverished your estate for the rest of your life aunt Egidia enters keith tell me fergus has taken a turn for the better Egidia, how can i look you in the face cannot we read a lesson from this dreadful occurrence to reconcile our views finally you see now how unfitted our son is to a soldier's life yes i have been wrong happily it is not too late to remould his character we must return to the ballroom first come with me and peep into the nursery by all means the nursery the nursery the nursery they go out as the dowager enters catherine dora i am beside myself have you heard the news news telegrams for keith i know nothing about telegrams i've just overheard julian talking solemnly to brooke do you know what your husband intends to do oh, grow his own vegetables bother his vegetables he resigns his place in the ministry <sighs> the same thing to herself oh why can't he wait sir julian enters with brooke catherine i have been telling brooke of the change in his prospects i say mater such a blow what pa why can't you wait wait for what catherine wait till the boy can patch up his future with a wealthy wife of course really dora i don't think it would be absolutely fair fair people's actions are like the heads of hair they can be dyed flaxen to brooke boy why do you let the grass grow under your pumps in this way i haven't let the grass grow aunt dora i ah i have the happiness to be engaged what engaged bless my soul in mercy's name to whom to effie euphemia 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 why how dare you conspire to entrap a child of mine into a moneyless marriage my dear dora you yourself suggested if i may be guilty of such an expression fa lal but aunt hold your tongue sir ah oh, i believe you all have abominable motives lady twombley to herself the telegram the telegram why is there no telegram the music of the strathby is heard imogen enters with lady euphemia euphemia lady euphemia joins the others imogen goes to lady twombley in agitation mamma the strathby huh? what of it i'm engaged to dance it with sir colin oh mamma i don't love him child you loved him the other night while your head was being washed i didn't see clearly then the egg julep was in my eyes but now lady macphail is running after me from one room to another because she declares i must fulfil the destiny of a macphail's betrothed and lead the strathsby by her side but i won't dance a deception before a room full of people imogen there is nothing for you but this marriage or contemptible cleanly poverty poverty child you are young to be told these things but what do you think is likely to happen to pa and me mamma keep nothing from me in all probability 
we shall grow our own vegetables oh what for for dinner ah oh, oh imogen have pity on your mother i can face contemptible cleanly poverty with pa alone but if i see my innocent chicks sharing our miseries every cabbage in our garden will grow up with a broken heart she embraces imogen lady macphail enters with macphail miss twombley lord drumdurus's guests are politely waiting till you are pleased to lead the strathby with the macphail miss twombley imogen quietly to lady twombley mamma lady twombley to herself no telegram from town to imogen imogen you had better not lose your dance with a slight courtesy to macphail imogen gives him her arm as valentine enters trimmed shaven and in immaculate evening dress why val mr what imogen imogen leaving macphail valentine valentine white imogen am i too late too late for the honour of dancing with you to-night you you are in time valentine for which dance this dance mother the child is mad stop the strathsby stop the strathsby she hurries out followed by macphail mr white really you shouldn't you know the music ceases sir julian lady twombley with your permission i shall go no further to avoid the shams of life i have found one cool resting place in this world where there is reality and sincerity with imogen's hands in his and i have found it in an advanced state of civilization the dowager pulls imogen away i positively must beg dowager to imogen child at this moment i feel grateful that i am your aunt with all an aunt's privileges she shakes her mamma lady twombley seizing imogen my chick your mother has privileges also bless you and valentine kissing her there dora if you shake my girl again i i'll slap you ah julian drum Durris appears with a telegram aunt what's that from reeves and shuckleback she snatches the telegram from him what's the matter what's the matter what's the matter julian look at your wife brooke imogen come to your mother <laughs> no more worries by day and bad dreams at night no poverty no cottage no no vegetables i i am a rich woman <sighs> she falls back fainting into sir julian's arms as they all surround her at the same moment lebanon rushes in with mrs gay luster he has a telegram in his hand his aspect is wild his face white lady twombley where is she lady twombley as lady twombley is assisted to a chair lebanon falls into another mamma joseph ah oh. ah oh. be quiet lady twombley is ill ill look at joseph my only brother keith explain this telegram or my brain will give way no no tell me my brain is stronger than sir julian's earl of drumdurst to sir julian and the dowager apart mother sir julian i want a word or two with my friend lady t mrs gayluster arranges his chair so that he faces lady twombley she and lebanon stare at each other oh, oh. lady t hello i've had a wire so have i from moss and emmanuel my brokers mine is from reeves and shucklebeck oh i see your brokers you've done me lady t oh, don't mention it you're a known one i'm sure i'm very gratified to hear you say so the bills 
Give me the bills you swindled me out of. He advances violently, but Mrs. Gayluster holds him back. Lady Twombley hands the bills to Sir Julian. Joe! Mr. Lebanon, the bills, sir. Giving them. Lebanon snaps his fingers demonstratively in Sir Julian's face. Drum, thank you for your recherche hospitality. Carriage to the station in the morning, if you please. Kissing his hands. Ladies? Breaking down. Oh, Fanny, take me to bed. He goes out. Mrs. Gayluster is about to follow when Lady Macphail enters with Macphail. Madam, my boy, my poor lad, has told me of your behaviour. My behaviour? He loves me. Colin? I thought I'd better mention the affair to mother. Of course. Conceal nothing from your parent. And mother agrees with me. Yes? That it would be just a risky matter to correspond with a widow lady. Ah! Macphail producing Mrs. Gayluster's card from his stocking. So I'm thinking I shan't require this address. Ah! She slaps his face violently and runs out. Oh. 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 Uh, uh, mother! Lady Macphail embraces him. The music of the Strathsby is heard again. Egidia enters. The Strathsby, come into the ballroom. What has happened? Oh, I can't enter the ballroom again tonight. But you must dance a Strathsby. Must I? Dance, then. They take their places for the dance. Pa, Valentine, Imogen, Brooke, Effie, Keith, Egidia, Lady Macphail, Sir Colin. Dance. Dance with foolish, thoughtless, weak-headed Kitty Twombley for the last time. For tomorrow she becomes a sober, wise, happy, and contented woman. Dance. They dance the Strathsby and reel. Sir Julian with Lady Twombley, Drumdurst with Egidia, Brooke with Lady Euphemia, Valentine with Imogen, Lady Macphail with Macphail, the Dowager, sits apart gloomily. Sir Julian Twombley to Lady Twombley while dancing. You've been indiscreet again, Kitty. <laughs> finally, Julian, finally. No more extravagance? Never, never. And you resign yourself to a peaceful, rural life? Oh. Promise me. Promise me. <laughs> Dance, Pa. Dance. End of Act Four. End of the Cabinet Minister by Arthur Wing Pennell.